All right. So we have uh, now covered Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Numbers we saw had to do with two numberings of the people. Uh, we also saw why there had to be two numberings. Uh, the first was uh, God's preparation for them to enter and to be a, uh, uh, an army of soldiers who can conquer the inheritance which has been given to them. And that is why the first numbering is done to count them as soldiers and find out exactly how many there, there are in their, in their army. But the second numbering, it's very sad that entire previous generation, because of their disobedience, uh, they all uh, were condemned to perish in the wilderness. And we see that only the younger generation uh, enters. And so the second numbering is done to find out now how many are available of the new generation which has grown up. Uh, so the, those were the things that we saw in numbers. Now coming to Deuteronomy, the term itself uh, in the Greek literally means a second law or a, you know, DEU, DEU that would be the phrase for uh, the numeral two. So DEU, second law, or uh, you can say a second edition of the law, or you can say a repetition of the law. So those are the um, terms that we can use to interpret the term Deuteronomy. Now, why was the law repeated a second time? First time they have already heard it. It was given to them in great detail at Mount Sinai. Why is this law once again being taught a second time? And it's specifically because now this new generation is going to go inside the promised land. And when the Mount Sinai event took place, many of them uh, were uh, extremely young or maybe not even born. And uh, so now they have to be uh, reminded once again of the laws which law which the Lord has laid down. Okay, so which is why there's a second repetition given over here in this book of all the laws which the Lord has taught. And also uh, this Deuteronomy is supposed to be like a warning to them to remind them of the really bad example which their parents had set in not trusting God. And so uh, they are being exhorted not to be like their parents, but uh, to be people who will trust God and obey him. So Deuteronomy can almost be called a summary of the previous four books. All that God had taught in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers is kind of summarized over here in our book of Deuteronomy. It consists of a series of farewell messages. You know, Moses is now reaching the end of his life. And so in each farewell message, he keeps reminding the people. He says, see, this is what God taught. So remember to do this. Follow what the Lord has said. So it's like a series of uh, farewell messages in which he is uh, encouraging them to hold on to, uh, to God. And uh, uh, we see narrative history. We also see portions of law where uh, the instructions and the laws which have been given are again listed, enumerated. And uh, we also have another small example of a new type of genre which we have not seen in the other uh, four books. That would be a song. Of course, once we come to Psalms, we will find lots of uh, songs. But over here in Book of Deuteronomy, there's one single song, uh, song and that is the song of Moses, um, in which he talks about all that Israel has gone through up to that point and how God has been faithful. And he exhorts them to hold on to the Lord and be faithful to him. Uh, so um, in the song, of Moses, uh, we see a kind of summary of all the history that has happened to the nation up to this point of time. So it's uh, it's supposed to be like a memorial where they are recollecting what God has done, and this should fill them up with gratitude. It should also fill them up with faith. You know, looking back on all that God has done for them so far. So it should build them up in their spirit. And they should feel encouraged that now the one who has been faithful all this while will continue to be faithful even in the future. So uh, uh, usually things were written in the form of a song so that people could literally by heart the words and uh, keep um, you know, repeating it and learning from it. 
so poetry and songs are generally written in such a way that it's easy to memorize easy to remember uh, so moses would have composed this portion in the form of a song specifically so that the new generation can memorize it so that they will always remember what god did for them as a nation in the past so that because whether in but once they enter the promised land there're going to be many challenges and songs like this will be a reminder to them of what god has done for them um one very uh, you know popular passage in the book of deuteronomy that would be chapter 28 and most of us are familiar with that uh, that's chapter 28 is where you have a list of the uh, blessings and the curses so uh, that's one of the more popular well known portions um yeah there are um, quotations from this book of deuteronomy 90 quotations it says in my notes i don't know whether that's correct or wrong but that's a large number if it is true um i do know that there are lots of quotations from the book of deuteronomy in uh, the new testament uh, but they probably don't really mean entire full quotes they probably mean just words and phrases found in the book of deuteronomy and are, uh, which are also found in the new testament books but yeah there are some very important references taken in the new testament from the book of deuteronomy the chief main example is that when jesus had to uh, you know deal with satan in the wilderness where satan had come to tempt him all the three quotations that jesus uses uh, to stand on the word of god all of them are taken from the book of deuteronomy so um, um sometimes when i teach deuteronomy there's a tendency for people to you know kind of doze off uh, because they think it's all just law and law is so dry but look at that jesus knew his deuteronomy inside out he knew it by heart and so when satan came and tempted he quoted from this book uh, so because he did not just see it as law he saw it as the will of his father his father had expressed his will and his desire in this book of deuteronomy so jesus learned it memorized it so that it would be a reminder to him always of what his father wants and what 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 he should do to please his father so we can look at laws and instructions as just something that must be followed or we can look upon them as uh you know uh, statements that are literally expressing the desire of god and it's our desire to please him right so if we think of it in that way uh, it would give us motivation to really follow those instructions which the lord has delivered um another thing that we could uh, say about the book of deuteronomy um, jesus quotes many times from the book of deuteronomy when he's talking to the uh jewish people and that's mainly because uh the jews of the of his day considered deuteronomy to be uh one of the most authoritative books in this first five books you know the pentateuch so in the pentateuch they regarded deuteronomy to be the most authoritative simply because it, it's a nice summary of all that has been mentioned you know in the first four books and it clearly tries to bring out uh uh what exactly the expectations of god are so it is considered a very authoritative book and jesus makes a note of this and he uses quotations from this book to defend uh, his arguments whenever he has discussions with them it is also said by some scholars that most probably uh, the book of deuteronomy uh, would have been used as the basis for the sermon on the mount now i don't really know much about this but that's just something that people say that probably matthew you know uh, chapters 5 to 7 were probably influenced by the book of deuteronomy coming to the structure of the book uh, maybe we, we could consider chapters 1 to 4 as the first section uh, because here in these chapters moses talks about the past history of israel and how god has brought them out um, uh, out of the egypt and all of that chapters 5 to 28 uh, would be one huge chunk 
can be called the second section because here you have a lot of instructions all the laws which are being repeated in great detail on how to live a godly life how to live in a way that is pleasing to the lord so that would be one major section chapters 29 and 30 uh, could be um, one separate section because that is where uh, the all the people stand in front of moses and they uh, make a commitment to god saying that they are going to keep the covenant which god has given them so in your in some of your bibles the heading over there will be renewal of the covenant so chapters 29 and 30 is where the people they come in uh, into the presence of god and they say yes we will follow the covenant which was originally given at sinai so there's a renewal of the covenant which is done um, where the people take a pledge and say from now on yes we shall do these things the last section maybe could be chapters 31 to 34 uh, where you have um, moses handing over authority to joshua and uh, in the last chapter is you know where we see god showing moses the promised land of course he is not allowed to enter uh, because of uh, his disobedience so but he is able to see the land and he finally is taken by God to Mount Nebo, where he dies. And uh, he's probably the only person for whom the funeral service was done by God himself. It's not human beings who did this funeral service. God does the funeral service personally and attends to his you know, body. Uh, so we do not know where the Lord chose to bury it. Uh, but uh, God does the funeral service for this man. Amazing man. Uh, but he could not see the promised land because he um, chose not to obey the Lord, you know, regarding the, uh, the rock. Instead of speaking to the rock and bringing out water, he strikes the rock. And a man of his maturity should have known better, uh, you know, because he had walked with God, followed him in every way, uh, knew the heart of God, knew what pleases him, what displeases him, had a heart of compassion just like God. So a man of that level, when he was told to speak to the rock, he should have done that. And so when he dishonors God by doubting whether God would really be able to bring water out of that rock, just if he simply talks to it, he thinks maybe God needs a little assistance, let me hit it, then maybe something would come out of it. But uh, the thing about the Old Testament is that everything in Old Testament has got symbolism. Every single deed, every single act is, is pointing in some way towards Christ. So going around striking the rock two, three times, like as if Jesus has to be crucified two, three times, it, it would lead to a lot of wrong doctrine. So he was, God was trying to bring out a theological point. The rock would need to be struck just once and that would be enough. Living waters would come out. So you see there's a comparison being drawn with, uh, uh, with Jesus over there. And Moses, unaware of all of that, he strikes it when he is not supposed to strike it. He was just supposed to speak and he disobeys. And because of that, because of that theological mistake which he has generated accidentally, uh, you know, he is not allowed to enter the promised land. So um, we see some key important prophecies. There are four main prophecies in the book of Deuteronomy, um, which actually talk about, which prophesy about what's going to happen to Israel in the future. So um, we have uh, a prophecy about how they will victoriously enter into the, into the land of Canaan. And that gets fulfilled in the book of Joshua. Uh, this is there in your uh, textbook. Okay, So uh, you can actually look at it. Uh, there's also a prediction of how they're going to sin against God in the land of Canaan. And we see the fulfillment of that happening in Kings and in Judges. There's also a prophecy given about how they are going to be sent away captive to a foreign land. So even the exile is also prophesied beforehand in the book of Deuteronomy. And of course, even their return from exile, how God will once again restore them. All of these things are recorded, um, you know, already even before these events took place. All these things were recorded beforehand in the book of Deuteronomy. Um, just coming to some maybe some uh, themes and concepts which we find in this book of Deuteronomy. Uh, we could maybe look at the 
Okay, maybe we can look at uh, Deuteronomy chapters 27 to 29, which kind of form a core, the main central theme in this book of Deuteronomy, because that is where the people come together and they take their pledge. This new generation takes its pledge saying, yes, from now on we shall follow the Lord. Okay, so that uh, we see that happening in chapters 27, 28, 29. So in chapter 27, Deuteronomy 27, this very specific instruction given to the people. Um, maybe one of us could actually read that out. Deuteronomy chapter 27, if you could maybe read verses 2 and 3. Deuteronomy 27, 2 and 3. Yeah. Okay. So God asks them to take some very large stones and to coat it with plaster. Um, no. Um, yeah, some Bibles translate it as whitewashing it. Whatever the point is that you're going to be applying something white on those stones so that you can carve out words, you can inscribe words into that. And uh, that will be a reminder to the people because uh, the other instruction that is given is that in verse 5 it says, also build an altar. So every time the people would come over there to make their sacrifices, their eyes would automatically go to these large stones which are there in the side with all of the laws written down on it. And it would be a reminder to them that they are supposed to keep these laws. Okay, so um, it would serve as a reminder to them. And in chapter 28 is where, you know, we have the blessings and the curses which are listed so uh, the promise which God makes to the Israelites is that if they would uh, obey him and stay faithful to him, he would reward them with a lot of abundance. They would uh, not lack in any way. They would always have uh, sufficient, um, you know, uh, a sufficiency in terms of economic uh, needs. And also God promises that they would be safe and secure because all the other nations would be afraid of them. God actually says that. He says that if you will stay faithful to me, the other nations will be afraid of you. They will not even have the guts to come and wage a war against you. So this is the promise that God makes. On the other hand, God warns them, if you choose to disobey these laws which I have given and you are not honor me by following them, then your harvest, your crops will fail your health will fail and also the Lord says that he will remove his protection from the people and then the enemy will be able to come and attack them. So all these things are given in chapter 28 and then we come to chapter 29 where all the people they stand over there and they say yes we shall obey what God has told uh, because we don't want the um, curses of God coming upon us. So 27, 28, 29 form the very core of the book of Deuteronomy. Um, we see a lot of passages uh, in book of Deuteronomy where again and again uh, they are told to teach their children in the ways of God. They are told to teach their children and remind their children of these laws. Why? Because uh, God does not want a repetition of what happened earlier in Egypt. Because when they went over there, Joseph invited them to that place. They all settled down over there. And then maybe after about 100 years after Joseph's death, they all just completely forgot their God. They reached a stage where they couldn't even remember his name. So which is why Moses says, when I go to them and I talk about the Lord, if they say, who is he? What do I say? You know, so uh, things had become that bad because the earlier generations did not teach their children the ways of God. So over here in the book of Deuteronomy, you have 4, 9, uh, Deuteronomy 4, 9, Deuteronomy 6, 7, uh, Deuteronomy chapters 20 to 25, uh, 11, 19, 32, 46. In all of these passages, we see uh, instruction given to train up their children in the law laws of God. 
so that they will not forget him the way they had forgotten him earlier and god will be able to bless them rather than curse them okay so you have many references to this um, then uh, coming to the 10 commandments which are mentioned here in deuteronomy chapter 5 uh, we see that it's almost identical to the list which is there in Exodus 20. You know, Exodus 20 is where God gives the commandments for the first time. And we have those commandments repeated over here in Deuteronomy chapter 5. The one main difference that we see, this is a small little difference in, in the way it's phrased. The wording is a little different between the two passages. But one main uh, difference that we see between uh, the Exodus 20 passage and this Deuteronomy 5 passage, the difference, the main difference we see is regarding the Sabbath. In both the places, God says you must observe the Sabbath, but the explanation why you should observe the Sabbath is a little different. Because if we were to go to Exodus chapter 20, uh, verse 11, let us see what God says about the Sabbath. If we could have one person read out Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. Okay, so there's a great significance over here of why all these Israelites should dedicate one day for rest and only focus on, uh, you know, God and worshipping Him and just relaxing and resting. So it was supposed to be a day of rest and it was supposed to be a day of worship. And the reason why God says they should do this is because on the seventh day, He had already finished all His works of creation and He rested from His work. Now, does that mean that uh, God was tired after doing the creation? God has no human limitations. Uh, so it, over there, when it says he rested, that would be old English. Basically, it's saying he stopped. He, you know, um, so yeah, it would be in the sense of, you know, he stopped. So when it says rested, um, for instance, if I'm doing my homework and if I say that, you know, I have rested from my homework and now I will go out. Uh, and, and uh, talk with my friends. So I am not uh, resting in the sense that I am exhausted. I'm resting in the sense I have now ceased from this activity and now I will go on to do something else. So the seventh day, the Sabbath talks about completion, how God has finished creating everything that you could possibly need for a good life. It has all been set up. It has all been established. Everything that is possibly required for this human race has been provided and there's nothing more to do so god has rested from his activity because there is nothing more nothing extra to be given already everything that humans require he has finished creating and so he rests from it and so the people the israelites are supposed to remember this and say yes when you created you created everything that we could possibly require. All our needs are met in you. And so we can rest in you. We don't have to slog on the seventh day the way we are slogging on all the other days. Because you are the one from whom provision comes. You are the one from whom health and, you know, uh, 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 and protection and all of that comes. So on the seventh day, we can remind ourselves that all that is required for humans was already created so perfectly that nothing more additional was needed and God rested. So we are supposed to rest in that knowledge. So what would be a New Testament parallel for us? You know, for us, the Sabbath would be a time when we would remind ourselves that on the cross, Jesus did everything required for us, you know, to be able to live on this earth and also to enjoy a reward in heaven. So all that is required has already been provided in him. So we do not have to be anxious and we do not have to be so desperate that, you know, we go and, uh, um, you know, uh, work even on the seventh day. Now, there are some people who will not get a break on Sunday, but then they, you know, they're given a break on some other day during the week. So uh, we all are expected to have a day of rest. We don't need to slog seven days a week, every single week because we have a God who knows how to take care of our needs. 
he knows how to take care of our finances so we don't have to be desperate like the rest of the world which thinks that they have to work 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 and earn and earn and earn otherwise uh, they will not be able to survive we never have to do that because god has finished his work completed what is required and all our needs can be met in him so there's a very beautiful interpretation for uh, why the sabbath should be celebrated and that's given in exodus 20 and an extra piece of information is given regarding the sabbath in deuteronomy 5 so if one of us could read out deuteronomy 5 verse 15 okay so now they are told not only are you just supposed to remember what god accomplished at the time of creation but now there's something additional something very personal that was done for you people specifically you people as a nation where god personally came down to you when you did not even know his name anymore where you had even forgotten him you were in that condition and you were crying out in your pain and god whom you were ignoring heard you and cared enough to do something about it and he raised up a deliverer for you and uh, so not only has he provided everything that is required on this earth he is even today personally involved in your lives he called he came to you when you did not even care about him and were not even worshiping him he came to you and he redeemed you with signs and wonders and miracles so it should be a reminder to them that they are resting in him not just because he has provided all at creation they are also resting in him because now he is personally involved in their lives and with his mighty outstretched arm he can do for them all that they require so which is why uh, whatever your work schedule may be whether or not you get an off on sunday do make sure that you do take a day of rest sometime during the week and on that day you know dedicate it to the lord and uh, reflect on what he has done for you so far and based on that all that he can do for you in the future so it should be a day of rest not just physically but even in your heart where you are reminding yourself of all that he has done and all that he will continue to be for you and your family okay so we do need the sabbath we do need a day of rest where we can uh, you know back off from the things of the world and remind ourselves of how my how uh, from where our true provision comes it does not come from the job uh, it does not come from our skills and talents it comes from the lord directly and as long as we are we place him first in our lives all the other things will anyway follow you know like it says in uh, um, matthew 11:33 okay yes now it it just okay the question asked over here in the class was that uh shouldn't the sabbath be on a sunday specifically um uh, so uh, in those days in the early church it says that every day they were meeting uh, you know together to talk about the things of god to learn to fellowship okay so they were doing it every single day they were meeting together um according to the culture of their times and according to whatever work they had maybe that was all right and then things changed you know no no longer were they farming communities no longer were they people involved in certain uh, commercial you know uh, works uh, life changed the nature of life changed so as uh, time went by um, they had to adjust and make a time for themselves when they could gather and remember what the lord has done so they began to use the uh, the pagan holidays as their day you know their day off when they can come together and uh, worship the lord so which is why as time went by they were no longer gathering on a daily basis because that was becoming impossible now they had grown in numbers they were they were a much larger uh, believer community so then they began to have fixed days and their days coincided with some pagan holiday so while all the pagans would be celebrating their holiday these people would be coming together to reflect on what god has done for them and then as time still went on and on uh, and uh, you know people came up with this whole uh, sunday to saturday business they felt that okay as as one uh, as, as one particular day is being set aside you know many of these places began to be christianized many of the 
countries began to be Christianized. And so then they set apart Sunday as the day. So uh, in the Bible, God did not say Sunday should be the day when you should have the Sabbath. He did say that one day out of the seven days should be a day of Sabbath. That he was very clear about. So depending on the culture that you are living in now, depending on your circumstances today, you know, uh, so you if, you if Sunday is impossible for you and uh, you cannot, then you would have to find a day where you can have uh, a day of rest and also some kind of spiritual nutrition. So uh, some people, they choose a Bible study or something, you know, midweek service. Many churches now provide that because they know there are people who cannot get their nutrition on Sunday and their fellowship on Sunday. So they try to arrange a midweek service or a midweek Bible study or something like that, which would cater to the needs of the people. So uh, the church should be willing to come up with those alternatives for people so that the people can continue to uh, have their Sabbath so that they can continue to renew themselves and strengthen themselves in the Lord. So I would basically say that maybe it's not a rule that it has to be only Sunday, but I'm very, very sure God expects us to have one day out of the seven days. He's very serious about that. Uh, it's a, it should be a time of rest from work and also a time of rest in him, in his presence. So. I think those things are more important for him. Uh, again, that's just my opinion, right? Um, OK. Um, there are uh, some questions which people raise about who wrote the last portion of Deuteronomy, the last chapter where it talks about Moses dying, uh, because a dead man cannot write uh, about his funeral, uh, So, which is why uh, they say that most probably it was Joshua because anyway Joshua was going to take over from Moses. So all the written, uh, you know, the scrolls which Moses would have written down, he would have handed it over to Joshua. So it would be easy for Joshua to add extra, uh, you know, uh, material that God is asking him to add. So Joshua probably is the one who would have added the last chapter. But then some others say that maybe it was. Um, the 70 elders who were serving under Moses, maybe one of them would have done it. So we don't really know. Uh, but um, it's only those who want to criticize the word of God who come up with these questions. You know, they say, oh, how could a dead man do it? So this is all fake. No, it does. It's not. It's not all fake. There's, there are good, reasonable explanations of uh, how, you know, someone could have written down, written down this last portion after the person had died. Um, OK. Uh, another thing that maybe we would need to know about Deuteronomy um, is that it's interesting because Deuteronomy is written in a particular writing style. Uh, it's like a contract. Okay, so in um, from the first millennium BC, uh, no, no, second millennium BC, second millennium BC. Uh, at that time, uh, archaeologists have found many, many treaties belonging to a nation called the Hittites. Okay, So a lot of Hittite treaties have been discovered by archaeologists from the second millennium BC. And in these writings, in these treaties, they used a particular format to write out the treaty. So in that same pattern, Deuteronomy has been written. Now, when it came to the first millennium BC, you know, one uh, century later, uh, the writing style had changed and uh, treaties were written in a different way. So that actually helps us to identify exactly around what time Deuteronomy was written because they used the particular writing style which was used in the second millennium BC. And uh, so I will just very briefly go through that um, because uh, what we have in the Bible is not just somebody, the work of someone's mind. These are all, these are all, uh, uh, writings with with historical backing behind them, okay? They're not just uh, things which someone fabricated in their head. These are all backed up by historical archaeological evidence. So over here, uh, in the same way, the Hittite treaty would begin with a preamble, you know, where you have like an introduction. In the same way, even in Deuteronomy, uh, chapter one verses one to five. It's like an introduction. And the speaker over there is Yahweh who is speaking. Um, then 
the next portion in this treaty would be uh, where they would talk about all the things that the king has done in the past and all the things that is uh, he's accomplished there would be a list of all his accomplishments in the same way when we look over here in our deuteronomy deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 6 up to chapter 4 verse 49 talks about all of god's acts all the things which god did on behalf of israel so again we have a comparison between the hittite treaty uh, format and the deuteronomy format then uh, then the next thing after talking about the king and what he has achieved, then they would actually come down to all the conditions in the treaty. Condition number one, condition number two. So those would be listed out. And we see that happening in Deuteronomy chapters 5 up to chapter 26, where all the things which God expects the people to be doing, all that is listed out. And um, then in the end of the treaty, there would be some specific things mentioned. If you look at any of the Hittite treaties, you would basically see these main features. If the person who is signing the treaty and entering into the treaty, if they are following it, these are the benefits they're going to get. But if they refuse to keep the treaty, if they break the treaty, then these will be the, you know, um, um, the punishment or the, that would be the, you know, consequences of their uh, disobedience to the treaty. So in the same way here also in our book of Deuteronomy, we see the benefits and the curses mentioned. And finally, in the end, uh, there would be a uh, there would be a portion at the end of the treaty saying that this treaty has been overseen, supervised by so-and-so God. And uh, so if you don't follow the treaty, may the wrath of that God come down upon you or something like that would be the wording in the Hittite treaty. And over here, uh, we do not have that kind of a witness from some imaginary uh, deity. Rather, we have the witness of Moses who reminds them of all that God has done. And so God, the one, God is the one who is saying that he will keep his end of the bargain. So in, in, a, in a song format, this truth is brought out that the God who has always overlooked and overseen and provided for them in the past, he will continue to do so even in the future. So, uh, I mean, those of you who are interested, if you were to go online, you would actually find that. You would find um, uh, articles where they literally write down the Hittite treaty in detail. And then in the next column, they would write out you know, uh, Deuteronomy and show what a close uh, comparison can be done between this, um, you know, the document, the Deuteronomy document and the Hittite treaties. So, um, so what we are reading is all based in history. It's not just something imaginary. All right. So, um, do we have any questions at this point of time? No. All right. There's complete silence in the class. Um, and I've noticed this generally happens whenever I teach Deuteronomy, which is actually very unfortunate. <laughs> okay. Um, if we do not have any more questions, uh, we will um, conclude the class. So um, maybe we, we can close with a word of prayer. Okay. Lord, we just thank you so much that uh, you have given your law uh, not to bring a burden upon us, but to express your heart, to express what you desire. And so, oh Lord, we pray that you would help us to look at your law, at your instructions, uh, not as something that must be observed out of a sense of duty, but rather uh, things that we can do to bring joy to your heart. Because, Lord, as believers, it is our desire to honor you. It is our desire to, to do things which are pleasing uh, to you. So we pray that you would give us hearts that will look upon your instructions, not as obligations that must be fulfilled, but rather, O oh Lord, as things that we can do to bring delight to your heart. I pray that you would uh, also help us to learn from all the other aspects of Deuteronomy that are mentioned in this book. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for listening, and uh, we will meet again next week. The Hittite Treaty thing. No? I, maybe I could put up the link for that. Oh, so yeah, I can give you a link for that. <laughs>